Welcome back. I've got Brenda Cross with us. Brenda, how are you? Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Whatever there time you, it is. <laughs> and, and and whatever day it is. I, as I tell people now, I said it's they're just called day now. We don't use Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday. We just call it day, and then we're we're covered. Makes <laughs> makes makes it easier for all of us since these days tend to blunt tend to blunt a little bit. So great connect with you. Um, you are the chief transformation officer of LifeSpring Learning. So tell us a little bit about that. Ah, sure. So I, um, I'm a corporate trainer and executive coach. And I, originally, though, I was an army brat. And so we moved all over the place. I think my mom said she stopped counting when she was about 19 at, at 19 moves. And so through all of that, I, I got some really great grooming on communication and building relationships and, and helping people through transition. And I always found even as I got into school and as I got later into college and into my first roles, that I always was leaning towards coaching and training people. If there was an opportunity to teach the newbies, I'd raise my hand and be like, yeah, pick me, pick me. And I, I became the guide I always wanted because I wanted somebody that would grab my hand and say, here's where the lunchroom is, or, you know, here's where this is and lay the land or an older sister. And I didn't have that. And so I, I get to be that for other people. And after a time on corporate, in corporate America, I was on Wall Street. Uh, I decided it was time for me to go out and hang my shingle and, and go into consulting. And that's the, the birth of life spring learning. That's awesome. I know you do some amazing work and I've been following you for a bit. And as we said in the pre-show, we've got some mutual colleagues. So I know the awesome work you did. The purpose of having you on the show today is around an article you wrote on LinkedIn, and it ties in really well with what's going on with COVID-19. And it's basically about coping mechanisms. And more importantly, as your article uh, dived into, is when those coping mechanisms that you normally have are not available, what do you do now? So tell us a little bit about the story and, and why you wrote the article uh, and and everything else with it. Yes. So I am constantly on the road as, as I think you are as well. And I'm going to the next team working with the next company. And so to be in a place where I am in the same place <laughs> for multiple days on end is incredibly unfamiliar to me. And, and it occurred to me that what I was experiencing and what I think a lot of us are, are going through kind of en masse globally is withdrawal. And, and I, it harkens back to, I had a pretty significant injury, uh, back and neck injury. And I was laid out and I was on my back staring at the ceiling for weeks and months before I could even get to physical therapy. And by the time I got to physical therapy, you know, my, my body was starting to improve, but my mindset and my overall mood, I was really struggling with feeling low and depressed and agitated. And my physical therapist said to me, he goes, you're a junkie. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you are going through withdrawal. He goes, you're an active person. You're used to being in the gym two hours a day. You're used to being on the road, moving. You're socializing, you're with clients every single day. And you've gone from that to nothing, which I think, many of us can relate to right now. And so that was the foundation of my article because a lot of people were coming to me in coaching and they're like, I feel like I'm going crazy. I was like, oh, you're not alone. But it isn't crazy. It's, it's that everything that we've relied on, the coping mechanisms that we've used, whether that's exercise, whether that's you know going to be able to go to a colleague at the water cooler and, and chat and, and talk about the latest fire drill, uh, all of those things have been stripped away. And so we're left to find new ways to manage ourselves, our relationships, new ways to manage business. So we're in foreign territory. And all of the biochemical pieces and all the neuroscience, you know, all of the neurobiology is shifting and changing. And so what people are going through is very real, not only emotionally, but biochemically. And I see that too. And we even see it in nature where, you know, there's certain parts of the world that have had a lot of pollution just because of human interaction and travel and whatnot. And because travel has been significantly reduced, all of a sudden, 
you know, streams and lakes are getting a little bit clearer. You can see mountains because the smog is is nowhere to be found. You know, even seeing images of you know, Los Angeles freeways and there's no cars on it. And at first I look at it, it's like, oh, that's Photoshop. That's not real, but it's actually real. <laughs> and you're like, and I've been on that road many times and I'm looking at going, hmm, that's interesting. I didn't recognize there was a curve there because usually we're going through it so slow we don't really notice it. Uh, but now it's like, wow, that would actually be kind of cool to go on a little stroll for the, you know, that road, just kind of take some twists and turns and, and actually go, wow, this is actually interesting. You know, it, it won't last long because once everything gets back to normal, everyone will come back and then some. But it, you touch on a ton of things. And one of the things that, you know, the withdrawal, like for example, for organizations that were never working remotely that now are completely there's that lost water cooler interaction. There's that lost, hey, let's go grab a cup of coffee interaction or the dynamics of being in a meeting room and kind of looking at everybody else in the meeting room and kind of figuring out from body language what the message actually is instead of what's being said. Uh, having been part of way too many meetings in my life, you get good at that after a while. You're like, okay, they're saying this, but I don't think they're comfortable with it. Or they're like, oh, they really like this. They're excited. But we lose that because in Zoom calls, for example, you don't necessarily get those dynamics with people and you're not looking at everybody else all the time. But you know, that's another area I think where withdrawal comes in and people wouldn't necessarily think about that. But now in this remote work type of environment, you know, that's a pretty big vacancy of, of time and effort and collaboration that we've kind of lost. So you know, what are some ideas on how people can adapt to that a little bit where they can still interact, but maybe not in the same way that they're used to? Sure. You're, you've nailed a big piece there is that all of the information that we're used to receiving in person, we're not getting. Like in a meeting, you're able to read multiple people at the same time. And now when we're on Zoom, most of the time people aren't even on their camera. So this is my first tip is that you want to use your camera and have as many of your team, if you're working with a group collaborating, your, your team, anybody that you're leading, be on camera and invite them as well. Because a, f a few things, if we're not able to see faces and we're certainly seeing far less of them, it's akin to the, um, what is, now I'm losing the word, when solitary confinement. So the reason why solitary confinement is considered torture and inhumane in some places is because of what happens to the brain when you're not able to see other people. Because we've got these mirror neurons, all of our, our brains and our bodies, we're constantly sending out information, we're constantly receiving information. And if we don't see other faces, our brains, they're losing a certain amount of stimulation. There's a lot of those neural neurons aren't getting anything to respond to. They've done research on people who've been in solitary confinement for long periods, and there is brain shifts, and there are sometimes irretrievable brain damage. So my first thing is use your camera because you are going to pick up on far more cues than just the voice, but you're going to get those benefits. You're going to get some of that face to face you're going to get, and it's so, so valuable for both. So we can give it, even though it may be uncomfortable. My key is it is about your sanity and it is about our humanity and not our vanity. So I know that most of us, we don't necessarily have a great backdrop. We don't have our own video studios in our house. And you know, we're probably doing more dressing with the uh, business on the top and party on the bottom. <laughs> you know, that's all fine. <laughs> but and use your cameras. So first and foremost. And the other is, is simply an awareness of that there are a lot of biological shifts going on and acknowledging that. Um, you know, it's, it's being aware of what is happening so that we can start to understand so that we can have compassion for ourselves and other people. Because our ability to concentrate, to focus, to connect, all of those things are going to be impaired a little bit. They're going to shift so we can have compassion for each other and for ourselves. So that all of the feelings, all of the emotions and the experiences are normal and understandable given what we're going through. So I, I want to normalize that for people so that it's, it's not that we're going crazy. You're not going crazy. We're not going crazy. Um, it's that we are going through this period of withdrawal and we've got to find other mechanisms. And, and one of my 
big, big tools. And this is great because you're in Canada, I'm in the US, is we're all inundated, especially here in the US, by our media. And what I find, I've, I've done a lot of training in Canada, and I really appreciate the way they deliver the news. <laughs> it's quite different here in the US. And so I say limit the news to 30 minutes so that you can get what you need, but that you're not constantly being inundated with negative messages, uh, because that's going to have a significant impact uh, on your state of mind and on your mindset. And so I, I watch Global National. I allow myself 30 minutes and you, you all are very kind up there in Canada. You report what's going on with your southern neighbors and you tell us, you tell us what's going on. I get what I need and off I go. Uh, so that's some, limit the media and, and also be thoughtful of where it's coming from uh, so that it's not constantly driving you into a fight, flight or freeze response because that's also what's happening on a biochemical level is so many of us have, we have, we're stripped of these mechanisms. There's a lot of uncertainty that's going on and our bodies and our brain, you know, have been hijacked by this survival mechanism. And so you are going to, we're going to be more susceptible when we're in fear. And also there are a lot more changes that are going on biochemically. We have less access to the front part of our brain, to the part that's reasoning, to the part that's making good decisions. So if you feel pulled to go to the refrigerator more, to have more drinks, you know, have more virtual happy hours, uh, or I've heard them called as zappy hours before on Zoom and we're having happy hour, it's a zappy hour. <laughs> um, part of that's happening because so much of the energy is being used in that animal part of our brain. And, and so the forefront, that, that has the good judgment is, is being challenged right now. So those are a couple, and I have lots, lots more, but those are a couple to consider. And I see it a lot too, especially with, you know, on the internet, you see all the, the images of your refrigerator yelling at you. So you've been here 20 times today. You need to go back to whatever you were doing. And we've seen too, I know in Canada and as well in the United States is alcohol consumption has increased because as the amygdala is yelling at us and getting us into this fight, flight, freeze type of state. We want to cope and we want something to ease something. And unfortunately, you know, alcohol is easy to access. It's easier to access than mental health services. And it's a challenge that uh, many of us are, are facing. And I think the big thing that, that comes to mind too uh, with all of this is when you are in this constant state and you are consuming way too much news and it tends to be negative, uh, let's not sugarcoat it. You know, the, there's a lot of dire news that we're hearing, but we're starting to hear some promising things, but you need to limit that. And when I talk with people about burning out, it's like you need to minimize your news. Don't hide in a cave, but at least minimize it and control the inputs. And I love how you say, you know, consider where the source is coming from because I've seen, you know, a variety of different things, you know, we'll pick on California for a second where the governor, I've seen a lot of his talks and yes, he's factual, but he seems to always kind of have a positive spin on things where, okay, we're doing these things. We're seeing great things happening, but we have to stay the course. And then you hear, um, other people like uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, you know, making comments of we're not going to be able to gather publicly until 2021. Okay. You're going to hear those things and someone's going to hear that and they're going to think, I'm not going to be able to go to a Golden State Warriors game or a Raptors game or the Lakers game or watch the Dodgers play or go to a concert or anything until 2021. And we're in April of 2020 we got nine months to go. And, and the thought of that could just really crush somebody's soul and, and hurt them. It's like, before you say something like that, we don't know that to be the case. Yes, we may need to graduate things and, and go in smaller groups, but that's very, it, it, that doesn't help people. And also too, what happens, I think, when everyone is looking at doom and gloom, you start worrying. And when you start worrying, you are stressing your body that of course is taking all its energy to deal with the stress. So what happens is your immune system starts to decline. If your immune system starts to decline, then 
the likelihood of you contracting COVID-19 increases because your immune system isn't strong enough to fight it. So watching and limiting your input of negativity is crucial, not just for COVID-19, but your life in general. You got to control your inputs, just like you control what you eat, how you sleep, what you drink, what you consume, you know, from news and information. So I love how you talk about that. So, so what else? Um, what are some other things that you're seeing? And, and obviously your experience too, when you were going through this, and I'm glad to see that you're, you're vertical. Um, that's helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like I mean, you could you could hold the you know the the laptop and kind of lay on the back like this. Although if you if you lose the grip, then all of a sudden we get a much closer look to your face as the laptop crashes into your nose, and that would be painful. Uh, but what are some other things that you've uh, that you've seen, and and especially in light of what's going on right now, that would be really helpful for people to know to help them navigate through this time? Hmm. So, a couple others are carve out your time carve out quiet time if possible. And I know this can be a big challenge for those of us that now have these young summer interns with us and we have new colleagues that are working with us at home. So we've got a whole new dynamic here. It is so important though that you get some time and, and maybe it's, it's taking a longer shower. Uh, it's, you know, maybe the bathroom door might be the only door for some people. I, I spend my time between New York and California and you know, there are a lot of places in New York that the bathroom is the only door you got. So a little bit more of, of you time, however you can carve that out is, is really important because it's downtime for the brain and it's downtime for our system and it's just time to go internal. Other things that you can do in that kind of quiet time to consider is a lot of writing, uh, whether that just free form, you can journal if you journal or you can get on your computer and you can just type in just whatever is there. It doesn't need to make sense. It doesn't need to have punctuation or spelling or anything. It's a free form way of just letting kind of what's on the brain spin off and it's a way of kind of dumping it, if you will, and, and freeing up more space in your brain. Um, so writing is a great one. And it makes me think of, I was having a conversation with a client the other day and she was saying, you know, gosh, we're into you know, week five, I believe. And, I, you know, this idea kind of just going stir crazy. And she said, you know, I, I, I just don't know how much longer I can do this. And, and I think your point is really valid when we hear people that kind of make these really long projections. It's so much to take in that we can't really fathom it. And it's, too, it's just too much. So we, we've got to deal with, we've got to deal with today. We've got to deal with this week. So bring it back into a small period. But, but in this conversation, she's saying, I just don't know how much longer I can do this. And she said, I said that. And someone told me, well, do you know how long Anne Frank uh, was alone and couldn't go out and inside. And I believe it was something like 752 days. And, and it's great to put that into perspective. And that was writing was one of the ways that she managed that type of, that type of solitude, that type of such a, a small life, if you will, life became much more small and much more insular. And, and here's the key distinction, though. When we share perspective, it is about that. It's about helping us look at another view and look at how other people have managed incredible circumstances. And, and Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, was great in this and is an incredible reference. The thing is, is that if it provides us with perspective to say, oh, wow, someone else has done something like this and I can tap into that part within myself, that's great. What it is not designed to do is shame other people to say, hey, what you're feeling is not right. Because I see that sadly in, in a bit of the, you know, so on social and Facebook and things like that. There was a person who was sharing, you know, her kids really depressed and, and down because they're missing their college graduation. And another one's missing uh, a high school graduation. And, and someone was like, there are people who live on less than $2 a day in this world, get it together. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Because yes, people do live on far less than many of us do in a day. There are people who are experiencing hardships of all kinds and it does not take away from anybody's loss. All of us are having loss on many levels. We're, we've lost 
jobs, we're losing loved ones, we've lost our ability to travel, but we, we've lost our ability to connect with people, even a simple hug. Those things are all losses and we experience them, whether we acknowledge it or not, we experience them. And so we don't wanna compare our loss to anyone else and we don't wanna use other people's losses or other people's experiences that might seem more or worse as it means to judge ourselves and shame ourselves. It's about compassion and understanding everybody's going through challenges, everybody's going through some, some form of loss. And how can we be compassionate with ourselves and others? Compassion is a it, huge tool. It's, it's crucial. And, you know, there's so many people that have lost so many things and huge to them, maybe not necessarily a big deal to us. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's seeking to understand and going at it with love and compassion and, and, looking forward to, you know, connecting again with people in the way. And my hope uh, throughout all of this is once things get back to whatever normal looks like, is that each of us take the time and actually enjoy the moment. Uh, it's amazing. We've been stripped from so much right now over a very short period of time. And yeah, it, the Anne Frank example is a great way to do it because a lot of us feel like we've been holed up for, for years and it's been, you know, for many of us, maybe a month, maybe six weeks, something like that, which does feel like an eternity, but it's not in our grand scheme of our life. You know, for those of us that have been around the block a few decades, it's like, okay, six weeks, that's a blink in most of our lives. But again, because we've gone through this withdrawal and these losses, it's it's huge, and I really hope that when we come out of this, you know, we come at it with a little bit more love, a little bit more compassion. You know, you know, those hugs will mean more. I hope for people uh, because we haven't been able to do that, and you know, it's I'm I'm looking forward to being able to going to events and speaking at events that I get to do that I haven't been able to, you know, so far since this is launched and. I miss that, but you know what? I'll, I'll adapt. I get to do webinars instead. I get to do live video calls instead of speaking on a stage. So you adapt, but you still get to get your message out and you still get to interact with people. Yes, it's different. It's not the same, but at least we get to do that. And I think that's so crucial for all of us to look for the silver lining and say, okay, yes, we can't do this, but what can we do? and focus on the positive of what we get to do. And, and when we get to do things, when we get to do those things again that we really like to do, I think, again, my hope is that we will cherish those a little bit more than we did before and take less things for granted and really embrace life as the best way we can. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. That ability to appreciate and, and, even on a deeper, richer level as a result of what we've gone through. I'm with you. I hope that we do bring that forward and enrich our appreciation for each other and for the things that we do have. And that's, that's another piece is when we're in these times, and this, this is going to be per perhaps challenging for some people, but is a question to ask is how is this benefiting me right now? How is this situation benefiting me? What are the advantages? of the situation, it's, it's not an easy question to ask ourselves in these moments. And I challenge and invite people to play with it because there is no black without white. There's no dark without white. There is both sides to every situation. So even in the most challenging, there's something that might be benefiting us. We might have to look for it and we might have to look hard, but it is there. And if we challenge that, we can start to train our brain. We can start to train our system and create a habit about, okay, wow, this sucks, <laughs> or this is really tough, but what in here, what in here is a gift? What in here is, could be an advantage? I think that it's quoted by Fred Rogers, um, Mr. Rogers, who would say, his mother would tell him, when there are catastrophes, look for the helpers. I, and that's a great example of, even in light of some of these huge challenges, there are people who are stepping up. We have all of the people who are out there right now on the front lines. And it, 
you, they're out there giving and they're out there putting themselves at risk to help other people. And so what is the good that can come from this? What can we take with us? And, but what can we focus on even right here and right now? And what are those benefits? So that's a, a it's a bit more of an advanced <laughs> question to ask, but if, if you feel to, willing to take it on, I, it can be really rich and it's worth it. And it just, it helps us shift our brain because we has, as I know, you know, Michael, our brain has a negative uh, bias. It's the negativity bias because from, as animals, our brain was designed to keep us safe. So it's constantly scanning for what could go wrong, what could go wrong, what could go wrong. So it doesn't mean you're a bad or a negative person. That's the brain. So we want to make sure that we are actively and consciously trying to bring in the good information. And that takes a little bit more effort because that's not how we're, we're biased. That's not how we're built. So we can bring that in with that type of a question. And, and being open to what's there. That's such an important question for each of us to ask. And I, I highly encourage everybody to do that work. And it, yes, it might take some time to find, you know, what's the positive of this? What, what's the opportunities to do something and improve your life if you want, or change something that you've wanted to change, you know, look for the opportunities and, and jump right into it. Brenda, I've loved our conversation today. Where can people find out more about you and this awesome work that you do? Oh, thank you. Best places to find me on LinkedIn, Brenda Cross. Uh, you can also find me right now. I'm going through a refresh. I'm using this time to refresh the uh, website so it's down. Um, Life Spring Learning, you'll find me there, uh, as well as Engaging Talent Group, which is what we do with a lot of the leaders. Awesome. And I'll have those links in the show notes. So Brenda, thank you again. Great to connect with you. Uh, continue being safe and well and um, look forward to meeting you in person and, and give you a big hug. Um, assuming that they allow that at that particular <laughs> point in time. Otherwise we'll do like a, a virtual hug kind of thing. Type yeah, of oh, stuff. thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. It's been great talking with you. Likewise.